Hey, Data Junkies, welcome back. So excited to be here with you. We're going to continue our journey on multiple linear regression. We are over the hump of topic videos of the things that we kind of need to know to do multiple linear regression. And now we're in the area of, hey, this is some really cool stuff that we can also do on top of and see what sorts of things we can come up with to better specify our model and better understand the world around us. So in the previous video, we talked about interaction terms and we can start multiplying variables together to see what kind of other effects we can get. This time, we're going to talk about a topic called transformations. And transformations uh, can be very important depending on the nature of the data that we're dealing with, the assumptions we could be violating and whatnot. So let's go ahead and see what it means to transform a variable and then some examples of transforming variables. So keeping in mind that transformations Think of it just like the classic transformers. It is described as reshaping a distribution and other quantitative characteristics to one or more variables. You can transform any of the variables in your regression model. And we transform primarily for three major reasons. One, because it's easy to do. It's not a very complicated thing to change a variable to one way and then back and, and backwards and forwards. Another way, reason we do it is because it is a good way to get rid of skew. Sometimes having massive amounts of skew, high prevalence of zeros, things like this, they can really mess with some of the things that we're trying to accomplish in our model. So by reducing skew can help it out. And also, it can be a good way to help spread data out. If you're lucky, you can get it towards normal, but sometimes you can make it more towards normal if it's certainly far from where it was before. Now, when I said convenience, I didn't necessarily mean, well, we're just going to do it just to do it. No, I mean, sometimes we're talking about changing the scales of measure because it makes things easier to understand. And whenever your statistics are easier to understand, they're going to be more readily adopted and embraced, especially by people who don't speak statistics, which is half the reason I want you guys to do well in this course is not to know necessarily how to do the numbers. That's important, don't get me wrong. But you have to be able to know how to talk to people who don't know how to talk about the numbers, right? So sometimes making things more convenient can help them understand better. Caveat, some of the transformations we're going to work on are actually a little bit harder to understand depending on where you're coming from. So. Sometimes when we're talking about these things, we're thinking about changing things from percentages, from number counts into percentage counts. We think much more cleanly and easily when we're talking about things in terms of percentages. We can also talk about things like rescaling. Instead of referring to things dollar by dollar, we might talk about them in thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. Or if you're talking about how many arrests there are in a given area. We're not going to talk about arrests per person. We might talk about arrests per 100,000 people. So rescaling is just multiplying or dividing by a certain amount in order to adjust the limiting scales on here. Uh, there is technically another type of rescaling that's a rescale function, which will actually change the spreads of your variables based on a new minimum and maximum that you set, and it readjusts it from there. So R can certainly help you with that beyond just the basic plus, I'm sorry, multiply or divide by some common number and metric. Now, keep in mind, when you do this version here, it's not going to affect your skew. It's not going to affect your linearity. All it's going to do is change the numbering spread. Reducing skew, this is something, I, again, when it's nice to have normal distributions, but in reality, these things are not often found, and so there's different types of skew that we have. We've got right tail and left tail, which is the positive and negative skew. And depending on this type of the skew, we've got different transformations that we can apply that we're going to talk about here, like logging, rooting, squaring, things like that. Uh, the other time we want to do this is this matter of equal spreads. Now, sometimes we can experience things like heteroscedasticity in our regression diagnostics. This is when you're having that funneling and clouding effect or other sorts of shapes that can start to emerge in your data. And sometimes transforming your variables is a way to rechange how the distributions of those values are spread out inside your regression line, which is going to change how the residuals fit in your diagnostic plots, and hopefully, crossing our fingers, get rid of issues like heteroscedasticity. Now, changing some of these spreads make them easier to interpret and helps hopefully patch up some of our violation issues there.
Another type we're going to talk about here as we get in is standardization. I'm just going to touch on this one here because we're going to have a whole next video topic on mean centering and standardization here. But in this case, standardizing makes it from whatever count values that you had in your previous version into a standardized number, typically in the form of a z-score. And when you make this transformation, it does not change the plot and the skew and things like that. Things that are messy with your distribution are still going to be messy, but it's going to be rescaling. But what it allows us to do is account for the spread of a given variable uh, in terms of understanding where it fits through. And in order to standardize it, it's a fairly straightforward process. You take each observation minus its mean and divide that difference by the standard deviation, and you just create a z-score. Do that across the entire vector, and you've made a vector of z-scores that you can then have standardized. On the screen now, I have for you just an example distributions here where we're looking in the general social survey at a variable called eduk, which is the number of years of education someone has. In this case, we have some left tail skew, so it kind of looks somewhat normal, but then out on that left side, we've got a long flat tail kind of going out because there are very few people that have very few years of education. The majority of them are hanging out just after that high school and then another bump uh, at a four-year degree. And if I go ahead, and that's in the red, if I do the mean centering, I get the distribution on the right. Uh, it may look a little bit different. That it's probably just from some binning effects as well. Uh, but in, on the whole, we have the same general distribution that we had before. Square rooting. Square root is one that helps with good right tail skewness when you've got that long tail out to the right side. Uh, and it can be definitely useful when you've got zero, a lot of zero values and count issues. But squares aren't, square root roots aren't easily understood by most people. Uh, and so sometimes what we need to do is what we call a back transform. So in other words, you saw, you get your predicted dependent variable, and then you solve for the square roots back. So sometimes you have to do math to get it there, then you have to do math to get it back into something understandable. In this case, in the graphics here, on the left side in the red, I have the number of children someone has, and it has a sort of long tail skew going out to the right. And in the green, I have the kid's square root. It looks a little more messy and blocky and chopped up, but note that the x-axis is much more compressed. Instead of going 0 to 8, it now goes from 0 to 3. So some of what you're seeing is just sort of a bar chart differencing here on these gaps that are popping up. And that right tail has been much more condensed. It's far more compacted into the side. So there is still some skew, but not as bad as it was before. Squares, like square roots, squares also help change distribution shape, but this is a left side skew one, and it's really good when your original data is uh, working with a zero here. So in this case, uh, again, in the red, we have the education, which we saw had a left tail skew, and when I square it, it takes on a much more normalized looking approach in the green on the right. Logs and natural logs. Now these are very strong transformations. <clears throat> They're some of the strongest ones that you may uh, actually be using. And you can't use it when you have a lot of zero or negative values. Now that's not to say you can't use it at all, but you can't use it when the data is showing zero or negative values. We can get past that by adding a constant value. If you have, let's say, count values that go from zero to some positive number, all you have to do is add one to that distribution. So you, all of those zeros become ones, and then each count value was one higher than it was before. And then you can take the logs and natural logs, and they'll work themselves out. So in the graphics we have on the top and the bottom, the one on the left has this extreme long right tail going out, and then the one underneath is the log. In this case, it's number of fish, and it radically transformed the distribution there. Now, keep in mind when you're dealing with logs and natural logs, there's something else we need to take into account, and this is how we interpret these values. When your independent variable is the one that is logged, and your dependent is not, it is still as it normally appears, then we can do this when the independent variable has extremely large values, it helps reduce the effect of those outliers, and our interpretation changes to say a 1% change in your independent variable, as a coefficient divided by 100's change in the dv. So again, instead of saying a one unit change 
in your IV. We say a 1% change in the IV. And instead of a coefficient change in the DV, we get coefficient divided by 100 in the DV. When you're dealing with the dependent variable being logged and the independent is not, then the dependent variable might have extremely large uh, values that we need to account for. And then we can say the one unit change in the independent variable has a coefficient times 100 change percent in the DV. So again, it's percent change in the DV at a coefficient times 100 for every unit change in the IV. When we do the log and natural log and we have both independent and dependent variable logged, then we get to say that a 1% change in the IV has a coefficients percent change in the DV. So they both get to be accounted for in terms of percent change. And then the coefficients, just the coefficient value, just expresses a percentage, not multiplied or divided by any particular thing. And if you look at the graphics down below, it's fantastic for really pulling that data out that's really packed down in the, in the bottom right. It really helps draw it out into the rest of the graph so you can see how some of these things change. Now, reciprocal here, this is going to be an extremely strong transformation effect. It's taking a 1 over x, and it drastically changes a variable's distribution. By that, I mean that the big values become small values, and the small values become big values, because you are taking a reciprocal of each particular one. You can't use this on zero values, otherwise the universe is going to implode, uh, but you can use it on things that are positive. And when you do the reciprocal, it's going to flip the unit of measurement. For example, things that were originally population density, which you could say people per area, like people per block, people per mile, it then becomes area per person, or blocks per person, miles, square miles per person, etc. Or if we were to say people per doctor, then it becomes doctors per person. If we were talking about the rate of soil erosion, it would become the time at which it takes to erode at a certain depth of soil erosion. So these are the things we need to kind of keep in mind. And on this last slide I have for you here, we have some transformations on just the dependent variable, the response variable. And so we can see contrasting how the distributions can change with each of these here. So the original on the top left just kind of shows that we have this massive slope going down, very tall values on the right, going out into a long tail. Well, tall values on the left, long tail on the right. Then on the top right, we're doing a square root transformation. Note that the change of the values on the y-axis have radically moved, uh, and the distribution has blown outward a little bit towards the middle, almost more towards a straight line than a concave line, but it is still definitely curved. On the bottom left, we're doing a log transformation, which has brought it out even more and reduced the y-axis values. And then in the bottom right, we have the most extreme transformation, which has flipped its direction on the, on the graphic, and this is the reciprocal in this particular case. So this is just sort of your crash course introduction to different types of transformations. You probably won't use them most of the time, but you're going to find those situations in which you may want to go ahead and reshape your variable of the transformation in order to help make sense of the data points that you have, the interpretations you need to make, or to help overcome some of the violations you may be having in some of your previous regression models. And with that, I'll see you all next time, where we continue the talk on transformations with the special case of mean centering and standardization. I'll see you then.